And it's a God had given me the scripture last Friday. And so if you want to open the word to Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to start in verse 34. Matthew 25 verse 34. And it says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then shall the righteous answer, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we sick? or in prison, and came unto thee. And the king answered, saying unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it to unto the one of the least of these, my brother and ye have done it unto me. Let's pray before we get into the word. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, Lord, we are praying Holy Spirit, that you would begin to move and work, Lord, that your words will come out of my mouth, that your word would burn in our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What you have done unto the least of these, you have done unto me. The beginning of that chapter, if you begin to read it, it says the king stood up and he began to divide, to divide. God says in the end there is going to be judgment. We are all going to be stand judged according to our actions. And he took the lambs on one side and he put the goats on the other. And he called unto the lambs. And those are the ones he called blessed. And he said you fed the hungry. You reached out to the poor. You went to the prisons. This is what you have done. God is calling us to go. These are things that we are responsible to do. These are our responsibilities. Nothing is put into this word that is not to be taken, that isn't to be taken Seriously, we are to t understand that these are our responsibilities. And when we get into that day, I want to be one of the ones that Jesus says, You fed me. You clothed me. And you took me in. We talk about the poverty and the Dominic, and I can sit here and talk about it. But until you're there, until you see it, when I was thinking about the scripture, the instance that came to my mind was one where many times the Dominican is a hot country, it's a tropical country, and so after we've been out ministering and preaching all day, we like to kind of get a small little treat. And so we stopped at an ice cream shop, and we went in, and when you're in another country, sometimes they have different things. Um, that we're not always accustomed to, and so we all got our cups of ice cream, and then the cup of ice cream was this biscuit, for lack of a better word, that they kind of, instead of like a pretzel, maybe some areas here, if you're in Lancaster, they'll stick a pretzel in your ice cream, they stuck this biscuit in it. And so as we're taking, we're all going to sit down, and we're all, you know, kind of murmuring, what's this thing in my ice cream, and Somebody, you know, decided to try it. I was like, that has absolutely no taste to it. I'm not sure why they put it in there. So then we, you know, we're kind of complaining about this thing now that's in our ice cream. And there was a man that came into the shop. He was a shoe shine man. He's one of those that makes his living and provides for his children. 
by shining other people's shoes. And we always stop, especially my husband has a heart for them, knowing that the work that they do. And so they began to shine the men's shoes as we were sitting there, and they began to speak to him and you know tell him about the gospel. And when he was done, he looked at me and he asked me, my Spanish is not the best, and so I believe just the uncle was there translating for me. But he looked and he said, Jema, he wants your biscuit. And I said, he wants this? And I, and, and, and I wanted to say, but it doesn't taste good. And I've already taken a bite out of it. But I nodded my head yes. And before I could think, he had already gathered up mine. He had gathered up all the biscuits from the table. He looked at the girl at the counter and he began to make his way out the door. Before he got out the door, he was eating those biscuits. And it was like a kick in all of our gut because we thought he just took the very thing that we've been complaining about. And that was probably his only meal for that day. Because if you're only making five to ten dollars a day, think about it, how much does your lunch cost? If you've got to worry about putting food on the table. Many times those men that we say are only making ten dollars, uh, Jeff and, and his dad went down to work and build on top of our house and so they employed many of the natives that were there and they realized they're in lunch. Just father said they're not going home. And these were Haitians living in the Dominican. Their their poverty level is even more so. And uh, the construction worker said no. He said because they can't afford it. They can't afford to go home and feed themselves so they'll eat something for breakfast and something for dinner. And when you're working with cement, that's hard work. So Jeff's father said, that's definitely not going to work. And so they began to feed them during the day. But I thought, how much do we take for granted here? I know our daughter, she came and she stayed with us for that week. And many times, I know that was the first week she has had three meals a day, every day during the week. It was the first time she had stayed in a hotel. She didn't even quite understand that concept. And we showed her our home, and we walked into the one room, which is a little bit larger room, where we figured two of the boys could share, and she walked in, and she said, we don't need all those other rooms. We can all just sleep in this room. Why? Because she lives in a home with her grandmother who has cancer, and there's four families living in that home. Every family gets their own room. They all share the same bathroom. They all share the same kitchen. And that's life done in the Dominic. But what does Jesus say? There is hope. Why is there hope? Why does he bless some? He blesses us. Why? So that we can give. Amen. So that we can give to them. And when you give, you may not be the one giving directly, but guess what? The sower and the reaper get to rejoice together. So when you sow a seed, when you give, when someone else comes and gathers that meat up for the kingdom of God, you both had a part in that salvation. How amazing is that? How amazing is our God? And not just that we feed into their physical body as we are called to do, but what? We need to feed into people's spirit, into their souls. Amen. When we've talked about the tracts and the Bibles that we pass out, my favorite story that I've told at all the churches is one where, as I said on our trips, we go around to the churches and, and, and we talk to those in the neighborhood. And this one particular church, uh, we were going in. Um, we weren't having a service. I believe we were just there to talk and pray with the pastor, encourage them, and and check out, you know, make sure they didn't need anything. But there was a gentleman that came up to us on the way, and he was drunk. He could tell he, had, you know, he had been drinking, and he he came up to us and he said, oh, "I've been waiting for you, brothers and sisters. I've been waiting for you." And I'm not waiting for what? He said, "I'm waiting for you to get here. I, I'm ready to give my heart to God. I've just been waiting for you to get here. I knew you guys come. I see you come every year, and I." And he walked into the church with us on that day. 
And he walked right in uh, with such a boldness and walked in, got on his knees, threw his hands in the air, and began to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we prayed with him there on that day, and we led him in the sinner's prayer, and he worshiped God even when we had left the building. He was still there worshiping God. And I prayed for him. Oh, I had such a burden on my heart for that gentleman. And as I prayed for him months later, I thought, God, did you really change him? Was there a change in his heart? I know the state of his mind in that moment. And so I called the pastor up. I said, Pastor, is he still coming? He said, Sister, he's still coming. He's still seeking God. God. He comes every service. He comes in and he reads the words. And God is working and he's slowly changing him. He's slowly working on him. Because the minute we get saved, we don't come in and then redeem glory and serve God. It's a process. And God had been working on him. We went down another year. And as we went down, he saw us coming, and he came up and he greeted us. And again, he says, brothers, sisters, I'm getting ready to sell my, give away my chickens. I'm done with my chickens. And again, I looked at Jeff, and I said, he's what? <laughs> I know what I, I, at this point, I'm starting to understand a little bit. And I said, I'm not quite sure I understand why he's getting rid of his chickens. He said, he's, he has fighting chickens. He said he uses to fight them for gambling. You've got to understand, that's how he put food on his table. That is how he paid his bills. That's how he made his money. And he knew, as he read the word, the Holy Spirit began to convict him of what he had been doing. And he knew that it wasn't of God. And so that man so fell in love with our Savior that he was willing to give up his livelihood and trust that God was going to provide. And he said, in fact, I won't even sell them. I want no part of that money anymore. He said, I am giving them away because I am done. I am a new creation. I am a new creature. That is what our Savior does. That is what he does. He changes us from the inside out so that we can no longer go on living the way that we had. I had a professor in college who used to say over and over again, if you could truly understand how much God loves you, you could no longer go on living the way that you have. He said at, no, at any point of your Christian walk, that always applies because we cannot fully understand how much he loves us, how much he provides for us. You know, often in my life, as I said, I was called to the mission field as a child. I was, I am a very vocal person. I am not quiet. <laughs> I went to a public school. They knew what I stood for. They knew who I served. I wasn't boisterous, I didn't beat them over the head, but I loved them, and they knew that. You know, I'd have the Bible club, they knew who to come to. I'd had a teacher in back pull me out of class to pray for a kid who had just found out he had had cancer. And, that, and that's what God did, so I thought, you know, I kind of straightened myself up. I'm good, I'm an evangelist, I tell people about Jesus. And I went on my first trip, it was my second trip after the kids, and on the way back home, I remember talking to God and telling him how frustrated I was that I didn't know the language while there in Dominic. And he said, but you live in a country right now that you do. What are you waiting for? And I said, but I tell people about you. He said, you tell those that God bring in, brings into your life. He says, but do you seek people out? So you go out of your comfort zone. Do you go to the ones that are hard, the ones that have a wall? You know, those who have a wall about 10 foot wide and you're afraid to even mention the name because of their reaction. The ones that have been so hurt and broken that they won't let you in unless you sit there and say, I'm here, I'm in your bubble, I'm in your life, and I'm not going anywhere until you understand how much God loves you. 
And in that moment, I made a decision that I wasn't going to be silent. I wasn't going to stay put no more. I wasn't going to wait simply until I became a missionary into another country, but that I was going to begin to move. I was going to begin to seek out others. And since that day, God has done mighty and great things. And I'm telling you, I have had my days of frustration. I have had my days where I've said, God, I've fed everything that I can into this person, and I don't know what else to do. They are yours, and they are yours alone, and not even much later than calling out, Jama, I'm done with this lifestyle. I'm done living this way, and I'm ready to give my heart fully to the Savior. Why? Because I chose not to give up. I chose to say, God, I'm going to let your Holy Spirit move and work. I'm going to let you be the leader in this. We've talked about how today is the day of Pentecost. God sent us a helper to help us out. And that's in our everyday life. Amen. You know, I've talked about the passing out tracts. I've talked about active ministry. But what about our daily life? What about when you eat? We all have to eat. Sometimes we feel like those daily things don't really have much of an impact. How much can God do in those times? When you go on mission trips, you still have to eat. You still have to take time to rest. But guess what? God can use you in your time of rest. God can use you in your time of rest. On a trip, when we were down there with a group of teens, we were eating at a pastor's home, and she knew of a boy who just needed that. He needed to hear others who were on fire for God. So she invited him over for dinner. We didn't know his story or anything about him. She brought him. He came in. He arrived and we just talked with him. And when you love God, what do you talk about? You talk about God. And, and so the conversation began to go in such a way that we realized that he was not serving God. He was 15 and he had fallen out of the church. And he was no longer serving God. But in that dinner, on that day where we felt like we were just doing nothing, God used us to change that boy's destiny forever. Two years later, he was in a motorcycle accident. And he went to be with our Savior. And it did end there. When my husband and Jeff, and my husband and his dad went down to buy our home, they were hoping to go down for this young man's funeral, and it didn't work out in that way. God had other plans. On their way back, there was a Dominican sitting next to them, and they began to talk with him and found out that that gentleman was the boy's uncle, and he was down there for the funeral. And that uncle wasn't serving God anymore. And so they began to feed into him and begin to minister to him. And when they got back to the States, they were able to call the mom of the boy up, his, the man's sister, and he said, you'll never believe who God put next to me on the plane. What a testimony. Again, we don't understand how much God loves us. And if God loves us that much, if God has forgiven us, of all of our sin, if he has forgiven us so much so that we now are clean and made white, how much more are we to do for others? How much more are we to be those and say, hey, I see that you have no clothes. Let me give you clothes. Funny story, I forgot my clothes. <laughs> Called the pastor's life. I forgot my clothes for service. I told her, I said, you'll never believe the scripture that I already had for Sunday. <laughs> but it, what about their spiritual needs? The word is equated to the bread of life. Do we feed the hungry? Do you feed those who are hungry spiritually? Or do you go to work every day and see that person Go through the same situation day after day after day after day again without knowing the truth, without knowing that our Savior has come 
to set them free. Because I'm telling you, this is the answer right here. I wasn't planning on an altar call this morning, but I do feel um, whoever is supposed to come to the piano would like to come. And just play this, whatever is on your heart. But if you'd like to come up to the altar, God's working on your heart to become more bold in your faith. If God's working on your heart to give more into missions, if God is working on your heart, please come to the altar. Please give it to Him today. So if we could all stand and all of us come down, let us all pray. Because I believe that God has a plan for all of us. And he wants to use each and every one, from the youngest to the oldest. So just go ahead and make your way down, and let's pray together.